Between them, they have over 80 years of political campaigning experience. Tonight, Jim Sillers and George Galloway will go head to head on independence. Good evening, welcome to the latest in our series of Newsnight Scotland referendum debates. Tonight, we have two veteran campaigners in the spotlight. Jim Sillers has made the journey from being a Labour MP to becoming Deputy Convener of the SNP, in between finding the breakaway Scottish Labour Party and winning the 1988 Govan by election for the SNP. He's written a manifesto for a socialist independent Scotland called In Place of Fear 2. George Galloway has been a Labour MP, representing Glasgow Hill Head from 1987 until 2005, although he was expelled from the Labour Party in 2003. He's now the MP for Bradford West and leader of the Respect Party. He's touring Scotland, campaigning for the Union with his Just Say No shows. Welcome to you both. Well, let's get started. Isabel, you've got the first question. George Galloway, would an independent Scotland have the people and the talents to prosper? Sure, uh, the Scottish people are tremendously resourceful. Talent will not be in any shortage, uh, neither will resourcefulness. But the facts are chills that win a ding. This proposal that we're voting on in September, which is not Jim Sillers' proposal, but Alex Salmon's, is, as Jim Sillers described it, nonsense on stilts. And it's a very poor uh, campaigning slogan. Vote yes for nonsense on stilts. Uh, Mr Sillers, if I can ask you, are you happy to kind of leave the people of the north of England, the Welsh valleys, to a government that perhaps, a right-wing government, that they may not vote yeah, for? Before I answer that, it's very important that people in Scotland know that this referendum is not about Alex Salmond. It's not about the SNP. You're not being asked to endorse the white paper. This is a national issue. Salmond's mortal. The Scottish people are immortal. And this is about what we'll do with our country when we are absolutely free of Westminster. Now, am I happy to leave the people of the northeast of England? Well, we are not a region of a country. We are a nation. And we can escape from what is to come inside the United Kingdom, which is a skint organisation and which is at the final stages of the end of the English stroke British Empire. I'm very sorry for the folk in Merseyside in the northeast of England. They are stuck with the nation which they are members of. I look at Scottish state interests and say, we have voted along with you time after time after time after time. And we end up at the end of the day not getting the policies we voted for. It's time that we started not to be blackmailed by this stuff, but say Scottish state interests. We must look at them, and if that's the case, we decide that we depart from a United Kingdom in terminal decline. But there are no Scottish state interests. This is the fundamental flaw at the heart of nationalism. The bus driver in Bathgate has far more in common with the bus driver in Bradford than with the man that owns the bus that he drives, who happens to be the biggest donor to Scottish National Party coffers and the biggest funder uh, of the Yes campaign. I have nothing in common with Brian Souter. When Jim was a champion of the miners in Ayrshire, he had everything in common with the miners in Durham and nothing in common with the Yule and Dodds drivers who were scabbing on the miners' strike, even though they were Scottish. This is a fundamental flaw in the nationalist idea. But no, when, no, we no, look no. At, when we look at the political makeup of the UK, it's fair to say the Conservatives and UKIP more popular in England than here in Scotland. Is there not an argument for an independent Scotland being a social beacon for the rest of the UK? Well, it wouldn't be, because, as I said at the beginning, facts are chills that win a ding. This nonsense on stilts, which is, Jim, what people are voting for, no, it's is for a currency union with the Treasury in London. It's right, Jim's right, it is nonsense on stilts. You wouldn't be independent at all. You'd be entirely dependent on the fiscal monetary policy set in the Treasury and in the Bank of England, the clue being in the name. Well, what would well, happen though, what would happen, and it's already been announced by the SNP, 3% cut in the taxation 
on private companies' uh, profits. And we'll come to those Thus issues in just a second. The the bottom begins. We'll come to those issues as we progress through the programme. But could it not be argued that a yes vote in Scotland would be a seismic shift across these islands that could lead to political change and, and benefit in the way that you would like to see the people of Merseyside and these other areas that you've mentioned? Well, it would certainly be a shock, and a shock just like the one that Mrs Thatcher introduced, laying waste to the Scottish industrial heartland, which has never recovered. For example, when there are no MOD orders for the Clyde shipyards, the job loss will be the equivalent of the job loss at Linwood uh, when the motor manufacturers uh, pulled out of there. There's a real there danger no that Scottish... Why, why would there be no MOD orders before well, you progress wh that? Why language? would the MOD place its orders for its warships in a foreign country. Well, why would the Scottish Government not be able to come up with contracts well, I, and orders I, I, for that? I, I'm yet? not sure what size of a navy the new Scottish SNP Government would begin to build. But the more that they built, the less they'd be spending on the vital necessities of life in Scotland. And they've made it clear it would be a free market, low tax. They've already announced it's the one part of the budget they are ready to write before uh, independence a 3% cut in corporation tax. And so what they would have to spend would have many, many mouths to feed. Jim Sellers, would independence bring political change elsewhere in the rest of no, the no, UK? No, I want to answer this. George is doing what the no campaign tactic is, and that is to glue Alex Salmond and the SNP to the idea of independence attack Salmond in the SNP and therefore bring down independence. He has not uttered a single word against independence per se. Indeed, at the start, he admitted we are a viable unit, both politically and economically. It's hardly an admission, Jim. <laughs> well, it's a, well, it's a very important admission because you then have got to argue against that political entity being independent, which you have not done You've argued against Salmond and the SNP. Well, they are not the issue. They are the issue. No, you you would say that, wouldn't no. you? Because you have the same views on Alex Salmond and his nonsense on stilts as I do. But everybody knows this white paper was written by Alex Salmond. He's the chief minister now. He'd be the prime minister uh, in an uh, independent uh, Scotland. Uh, uh. You'd have an SNP profit tax cutting government. That's the reality. It's not Jim Sillers that will be running Scotland after independence, neither would it be me. It would be Alex Salmond. And the reason you don't want to face up to that is because you know that in the Labour heartland that we both come from, people are deeply sceptical about Alex Salmond and the kind of politics that he represents. Well, let's Alec, give no, Jim no, no, Sillers Alec, a chance. Alex to... Salmond will not necessarily become the first Prime Minister of Scotland. When we vote yes on the 18th of September, Scottish politics has turned upside down. I, for example, will be very happy to vote for a left-wing Labour government. I'm a member of the SNP. I know others in the SNP who went into the SNP from Labour in order to use it as a vehicle for independence. When it's provided that particular function, then we'll leave it be. And this is the Galloway no idea. Attack salmon, attack salmon. How about attacking independence, George, for a change? I do well, wonder, um, Mr Galloway, about your intervention in this country. Are they welcomed by the No campaign? Well, I have nothing to do with the official uh, No campaign. The campaign with Tories, I hate Tories more with every beat of my heart. They campaign under a Union Jack. Union Jack has nothing to do with me. So and I have my own campaign. Do you have a, a vote in this referendum? No, but I've got a voice. Yes, you do have and a you voice. You sought it out and brought me here. The, the so I'm last not sure, time I'm not sure you... where this line of questioning uh, well, uh, I leads. Well, I just wonder... Thousands of people have paid money to come and hear my arguments against uh, independence. Thousands of them. And you'll have a bigger audience tonight for Jim and me than you normally have. I promise you that. So <laughs> people are interested in what we've uh, got to say because we are both socialists and we are arguing about what the best way for the working people in this country yeah. uh, is. Now, my view is that the working people are all. I care nothing for Scottish landowners, Scottish company owners, Scottish billionaires, nothing. I have nothing in common with them 
other than that I was born on the same piece of rock, which is of singularly less importance to me than what the relationship to wealth and power is. Okay, let's, let's now then be... try and get into what Jim Sellers is proposing as what you've described in your book, a sensible socialism. How do we get from the sort of economy we have at the moment, highly integrated, modern economy, flexible labour, a lot of capital investment is mobile. How do we move from where we are now to where you want to be? Well, in 2016, we as a people in Scotland have options. And one of the main options is to move away from the kind of failed economic model we have at the present time. And it's in manifest failure. And I've argued in that book for what I call resource management, where you look at the resources of the country and you build wealth upon those particular resources. Let me give you an example from the oil. <laughs> Most debate about oil is about the oil revenues. I want to look at the black stuff itself. I want a Scottish National Oil Corporation, which actually owns part of the North Sea oil field on behalf of the Scottish people. Now, just think what you could do with a small portion of the black stuff. If we refined it at Grangemouth and then used it to lower the price of petrol, diesel and jet fuel uh, supplied to aircraft coming into our airports, you have a tremendous stimulus to the transport industry, to our airports. Families have got more money in their pockets and also you have a tremendous stimulus to the tourist industry. Would you nationalise anything else? Uh, I, I, I'm not talking about nationalising the whole of the North Sea. One of the problems we have in Scotland is that we are totally ignorant, most of us, of what the North Sea involves. There are 570 rigs out there. It's not a, it's not a pond. It's a major oil field. The Scottish National Oil Corporation can be created without a great deal of trouble, which means that we have a window onto the oil industry that we were denied when the British National Oil Corporation was destroyed by Margaret Thatcher. Mr. Sears, let me, just before we leave this, and if you don't mind being fairly brief, to pick up on a couple of points leading from this, you have also made comments about the decommissioning of rigs and how that should be compulsory, it, you know, and that Scottish government could direct that. And also the oil fund. Will there be an oil fund? Well, I'm opposed to an oil fund. <clears throat> I think that... One of the principal problems facing an independent government of whichever um, political uh, colour is the debt, the share of the debt that we would inherit. And I would use any oil money that becomes available for the reduction in the debt. And that therefore frees up a lot of resources for other things in the economy. So Alex Salmond and I part company on that. And the point I've been trying to make to George and others is that we've got options come the 19th of September. Well, before and one of them, one of them is to get rid of Alex Salmond. Well, well, before we come to George Galloway, just on that point, you said that you would like to vote for a Socialist Labour Party in an independent Scotland. Did you hear anything from Joanne Lamont at the weekend that would allow you to put your cross in the box for Scottish Labour come 2016 if there was a yes vote? Not yet, but there were moves, weren't there? And once Scottish Labour has Middle England off its back, then I think we'll see a very different one. And I've talked to people inside Labour for Independence. They have a dual purpose. One's to get a yes vote, and the second is to change the Labour Party to a much more socialist one than they have had previously, particularly under the Blair years. And if we get that, I will be very happy to cast a Labour vote. Uh, Mr Galloway, this vision of kind of sensible socialism, is it not something that you would like to see as a vision every, for Scotland? Every right-thinking person is in favour of sensible socialism. The, uh, the task is how to get there. Jim and I together used to ridicule the Scottish National Party before the oil was discovered, when they seemed to imagine a kind of brigadoon Scotland based on whisky and tourism and uh, square sausage, if they had any sense. We used to ridicule it. Now we're being asked to support nationalism, now that the oil is running out. Jim has got all his eggs in the oil basket. But every, people in Scotland might be ignorant, Jim, about the intricacies of the Scottish oil business, but there's one thing they're not ignorant of, and that is that the oil is running out. And secondly, 
that its price what fluctuates what, what fantastically. You, what, It'll what, be finished by 2050. Do, what, My children, your children, and their children have got to live much longer than that. Now, the point is this. Jim and I have both known an oil price as low as $12 a barrel. And we've known it as high as $150 a barrel. 156 I think, is the highest that I have uh, in my mind. The point is, you can't put all your eggs in the basket of a commodity that's fast running out and whose price you simply cannot predict. What if fracking takes off? I hope it doesn't. But what if it takes off? The price of oil will fall. And if all your economy is predicated upon oil production, which is in any case declining, must decline, then I think you're, uh, you're uh, up the, the, the river without a paddle. But certainly... But it, it, excuse me, it is not predicated only on oil. If Scotland becomes independent in 2016, our balance of trade becomes huge, unlike the United Kingdom, which has got a balance of deficit, trade deficit, and has had it for years and years and years. We become an entirely different country. We can use part of the oil to stimulate the other parts of the economy. But the Centre we've for got Public a, we've Policy in the region balance. said today sorry, that actually the, the deficit in independent Scotland not is going to be lower because of falling oil revenues. So, sorry, if you just let me finish and then I'll answer your question. If, in fact, we have, we have a better balance between manufacturing and services in Scotland than south of the border. Now, what's your question? Well, the, the Centre for Public Policy in the region said the deficit would remain high in independent Scotland as a result... Oh, I've read that, yes. ...of falling well, oil one of, the, one of the things I find um, interesting about these think tanks is that the tank they think in is a very, very shallow one indeed. They argue in that paper that the United Kingdom will be in five billion deficit. They believe in fairies, if that's the case. Do you know what the United Kingdom debt is going to be in 2017? 1.55 trillion pounds. With the debt payment having to be around about 78 billion. The pre that's predicated on the present recovery, so-called. The present recovery is built on sand. It's built on the same basis as the crises we're just coming out of. More government debt and more private debt. Do you know what the private debt is? You know what the individual private debt is in the UK at the moment? It's £1.4 trillion. Pounds. But you talked about a reformed economy in Scotland. Just to go back to Isabel's yeah. initial question, how do we get to that point? How long does it take before, if the oil is a dwindling resource, before we get to no, this hey, reformed, hey, buoyant economy? Hey, hey, let, let's just get something to you. The, the, the misuse of words. It's running out, says he. You talk about dwindling. We're talking about 21 billion barrels of oil. And if it runs out in 2015, we've got from 2016 to 2015 to do something with it. We've been prevented from doing since the day and hour the first drop came ashore. But last year it fell to £5 billion, pounds, much yes. more than the Scottish Government's estimates. And the, and the current year... Yes. Shows a further fall, yes. not yet yes. published. Yes, it'll go up and down. We Quite. all know that. Quite. Well, yes. Who's to say in four years' time that it's not going very, very high up because of circumstances in the world? But what if it goes mean, very, very far down? Well, I mean, are you really prepared to mortgage your children and their children's future on a resource that is either running out or dwindling? or at least in Jim's terms, limited. It must be limited. There's no sensible person says we're still going to be producing beyond 2050. You're ready to mortgage your children's oh, future on an oil price you can't possibly predict that has been as low uh, as around 10 and has been as high as around 156. That just, that's nonsense on stilts. Who's voting for your form of socialism, George Galloway? Well, there is not an option here in Scotland. Well, there was in 2011, and there were three different socialist parties around, and they polled roughly 28,000 That's not my votes. kind of uh, socialism. The, you're talking about parties, or different classes of Trotskyism. That's nothing to do with me. I'm with Sillers uh, for sensible uh, socialism. It's not did, a question and, of who's voting for it. This is about a referendum in which it's yes or no. Yes to nonsense on stilts or no to nonsense on stilts. But when it comes to it, surely we're talking about voting because to the heart of this matter for many people is the fact that they would get the governments that they voted for well, they'll get in the SM. Scotland. Jim can whistle in the wind, but he knows that Alex Salmond will be the first Prime Minister. 
and he knows that Alex Salmond and his party, with their uh, addiction to nonsense on stilts, will keep the Queen, will stay in NATO, will do everything that they can to stay in the uh, uh, pound governed by the Bank of England, clue, again, I say, being in the name. There's nothing in that for Scottish working people. There might be for Jim Siller's uh, proposals. I haven't read his book yet, but I will. There might be something in Jim Siller's proposals, but that's not what we're voting for. Uh, Mr Sillers, do you see the SNP as a socialist party? Of course it's not. No. And it's never pretended to be. What is it? Uh, they call themselves social democratic, which most people will find very hard to actually define, but it takes them away from the tartan Tory idea that was always flung at them for many, many years. So it's not a socialist party. And that's one of the reasons why I'm quite convinced the SNP will not win the 2016 election. George keeps going on as if it's Alex Salmond that's the issue here. It isn't Alex Salmond who's the issue. It's my grandchildren and everybody else's grandchildren who are the issue in this election. If we, remain, election if we remain part of the United Kingdom in serious terminal decline, we'll go down the tubes along with them. So who's going to win the election? I would imagine a rejuvenated left-wing Labour Party would win the election. A very good chance of winning the election. Do you have any concerns at all, Jim Sillers, that at this stage, in articulating what you are articulating, that at the very time the SNP is trying to calm voters by, as George Galloway has criticised, retaining many of the things that exist within the union at the moment, they're trying to get rid of the fear. They're saying, look, this is what we've thought through. This is how this would work. There isn't an issue about currency, and on it goes. Have you any concern at all that you undermine the prospect of independence by taking the stance and making the comments you make now? No, I think I'm enhancing it. Uh, because one, as I repeat, it is not about the SNP. It is certainly not about the semi-manifesto in the white paper. It's about something the Scottish working class can rally to and get when they become the majority in 2016. But do the Scottish middle class have the stomach ah, for what you're proposing? Bit, Isabel, this is very interesting. Because a big chunk of what we call the Scottish middle class are like my children who come from working class homes and themselves have working class values. And I haven't found any difficulty in talking to that section of the middle class about the need to raise the living standards and the prospects of are, what we call the working class. Are they willing to pay more for it? It's interesting, you, you seem to suggest that there are different values in Scotland and others have made the same suggestion during this campaign. Yet when we look at opinion polls, for instance, the benefits cap that's being proposed by Westminster, popular with over 70% of people in Scotland. Maybe the values aren't so different. No, I think they are different, but um, it's one of the great regrets in my life that we have fallen for the Tory idea that there are the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. And if any of those folk are listening and watching tonight, I've got to say to them, it's about time you rate your conscience. The people responsible for the economic and political and social situation we are in today are not the people on benefits. It was the bankers who did it. So get your perspective right and get your priorities right and rediscover your values. Well, I agree with that, but it, it just goes to show that the idea that an independent Scotland would be some kind of cold water Cuba is perfect nonsense. The reality is there are 416,000 explicitly conservative voters in Scotland. There are many people who vote SNP in their rural and highland heartlands who are essentially uh, Scottish Tories. Uh, the idea that a Scotland that came out of all of this would be the kind of Scotland that Jim or I would like to see is perfect nonsense. We'd be in a race to the bottom and the losers would be the very working class that Jim has spent his life trying to liberate because the taxes in the country would be cut to entice corporations. The English Tory government, and it would be an English Tory government because they'd be starting with 41 of a start if Scotland was pulled out uh, of the Westminster uh, uh, arena, uh, would be cutting, undercutting us, we'd undercut them. 
standards, regulation, taxation, public expenditure would all fall, not rise. Therefore, the standard of life of working people and the poor in Scotland would fall and not rise. How can you guarantee Jim Sillers that that isn't no, the George, case? George is, George is actually in two, his mind is in two prisons. One is a United Kingdom prison. He can hardly view Scotland outside of the model of the United Kingdom. And he's in the other prison. He detests Salmond and the SNP so much that, that he can't move himself away from that target. The working class people in Scotland are in a, major, in a majority. And if you ally them to that group of the middle class I was talking about, then we will win in 2016. And I'll tell you why. Right now, tonight, there have been thousands, and I do not exaggerate, thousands of people working all over this place of Scotland for a yes vote. People who are becoming political and becoming radicalised as they go around the housing schemes. And they've told me, no way are we going home on the 19th of September. And one of the reasons for writing that book and the meetings I'm doing, I am trying to sow seeds of what we can do when one minute past 10, we have the sovereign power that is ours between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. Let, let me ask you then, Jim, so do you think there is a momentum now that whatever way the vote goes this time around, and I know what you want it to be, but whatever way it goes this time around, do you think now there is a momentum that is going absolutely towards independence at some point, or could that momentum be dissipated? No, I, I think the first tactic uh, to frighten the light out was, has not worked. The second tactic still has some adhesion, because that's why George is punting it tonight. This is about the SNP and not about the independents. But I'm finding as I go around, and I've been very extensively around Scotland, that people are beginning to say, we can, in fact, do it ourselves. I've been telling them, look, the greatest handicap we have is the myth of our own inadequacy. We've, been, we've had it punted to us time after time, too wee, too small, too poor, too reliant and big cousin England. That myth of our inadequacy is beginning to disappear. And when it finally evaporates, which I think it probably will do round about June, July, you will see the yes side actually in the lead in the polls. Do you think George Galloway independence is inevitable? Maybe not, not this time round, but not, at some not, stage Not in at future? all. In fact, uh, only one out of the last seven polls uh, have shown the gap even narrowing. And who knows what tomorrow's polls will bring after this debate. I'll be claiming credit if uh, they go uh, my way. Uh, I, I think that the majority of Scottish people realise that they have more in common with other English-speaking peoples working people, just a few miles away. There is nothing foreign about the people in Newcastle. There is nothing foreign about the Beatles in Liverpool. There is nothing foreign between former miners in Ayrshire and former miners in Durham. Do they are the same people speaking the same language, with the same culture, with the same economic interests, working if they're lucky for the same employers and joining as they should the same trade unions. Do we have a different view on nuclear weapons in Scotland and illegal wars, as you would as you would categorise them? Because we're told an independent Scotland would not find itself in the position we found ourselves in previously. Well, that can't be true because the white paper says we're staying in NATO, and it's NATO that's waging the wars. And the last time I looked, Scottish regiments were fully engaged in those imperial wars. Well, the SNP so, said 24 of the 28 NATO states opposed the war in Iraq. Uh, but they'd still have to be following the orders of NATO, or leave it. Why didn't they have the courage of their convictions then and say we will not be part of NATO? I'll tell you why, because there are large parts of the SNP's electorate who wouldn't support that. This myth that Scotland is somehow a colony of England, when in fact Scotland and England together colonised the whole world and their empire was so vast that on it the sun never set because God would never trust us in the dark, is one of the most hollow... I know Jim Sillers very well. Not as well as Jim. And if there's anyone to test Jim Sillers, uh, Jim uh, Alex Salmond, it's more Jim Sillers than me. But I know him very well. There's nothing anti-imperialist or anti-war about Alex Salmond and the SNP. I've got very good news for George. When we're independent, 
Trident goes, and we've been told that if Trident goes, we can't join NATO. Goes where and when? Where is it going to go? How, well, how much go. safer are you with Trident on the Tyne than you are but with George, Trident George, on the George, Clyde? George, if we vote no, we've got Trident forever and ever, amen. At least if we vote yes, Scotland has made a contribution to the worldwide anti-nuclear campaign by getting rid of it. I've seen you on the television, George, being dragged out of exactly. the, the Trident base by the police. Why don't you want us to get rid of it? I do, but you won't be getting rid of it because it will only go across a border, and that's something Jim doesn't want to talk about. The fact that there will actually be a border has to be a border because we're going to have a different immigration policy in Scotland, aren't we? to the one that the Tory government in England are going to impose. And you can't have two separate immigration policies on one small island without a border. It'll only be going across the border, which means that in any nuclear exchange, we'll be eviscerated just the same, whether it was in the Clyde or whether it was well, on the Tyne. The only way to get rid of Trident is to get rid of it from this island altogether. And that requires a real Labour government uh, committed to destroying it. The kind of Labour government Jim says is possible in Scotland. Well, if it's possible in Scotland, why isn't it possible in Britain? Can we move? Uh, well, well, just a very brief point, if you wouldn't mind. Tell George, to why? George's own words at the Oxford Union in October, and he's talking about a real Labour government south of the border. Political class, and he's talking about the lot, completely incapable of rising to the challenge, merged into one at Westminster. Two cheeks of the same backside could not slip a sixpence between them. So George is ask, actually urging us to vote no to remain in a system which he utterly despises and actually has destroyed verbally with, with his normal colourful language. But he hasn't asked, answered my question. We have a chance of getting ridden Trident from Scotland. If there's nowhere to put it in England, then it's finished. You tell me where it is that you would put it in England, you're an English MP, if we take it out of Scotland. I'm Scottish. Now MP you're an English an... MP, George, oh, you're responsible we're really, for England. Are we really reduced to that? I'm now an English MP. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm a Scottish man. English MP. I would have still been a Glasgow MP if Tony Blair hadn't expelled me over the Iraq war and then abolished my well, let's, constituency. Let's, let's, let's so please, over history. No, Gentlemen, no, if you please, don't mind, no, don't mind can, we, can we look no, to the future? No, no, please. Can, no, I, can no, I just I change? That Jim Sellers would reduce to a kind of back of the hand, you're an English MP. So you're, the, you represent an English constituency. Oh goodness. You may be a this, Scot, but you're the, an English MP. This is where nationalism ends up. Let's stay around. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on to, an English let's move on to another contentious area because there are many. Uh, Jim Sillers, you don't want a currency union with the rest of the UK. Right. Did George Osborne's statement where he said no vindicate your position? Um, I, that's from the English point of view. And I was always brought up, by the way, as a trade union official, always to look at the other end of the telescope to see why. And I anticipated, it was absolutely obvious it was going to be anticipated. And the worry I have, let's assume, and by the way, can I put on the record that I do not detest Alex Salmond <laughs> at all. Uh, uh, my feelings for Alex Salmond don't run uh, anywhere near that level. But let's come back to the currency. On a scale of one to ten, how much do you dislike Let's, let's stick with the currency, Zero. if you don't mind. <laughs> Zero, George. <laughs> I don't think he would agree. No, who are Alec? Alec and I can chat away about the golf, no bother, George. Let's, stick with the currency. Anyway, let's, get, let's get back to, to, to the currency. Let's assume Alec's right. And there are technical reasons why he could be right. Uh, because the Westminster balance of payments would be severely damaged by Scottish independence. And we go down there and say, have you changed your mind? And Osborne or whoever it is says, yeah, we have. We've had a second thoughts. We've changed our mind. Uh, here are our terms. Scotland not having an alternative would be in a very difficult position to reject the terms then offered. So I think we would be in a very weak negotiating position. My argument is that we have a separate Scottish currency on a one-to-one -one basis with sterling. And if I can point out, I've got a £5 note here, which is the Royal Bank of Scotland we actually already operate on a one-to-one -one basis with separate Scottish currency. But if what you're talking about is sterlingisation, you're going to have to have massive reserves to sustain that. Ah, but you? that's where I come, what I mentioned earlier, Isabel. 
when we become independent, all of our exports, and that's the oil and the whiskey and the salmon and the food and the manufacturing and all the rest, become a Scottish export. And our, nobody disputes this. Our trade balance will be huge. And when you export more than you import, you bring in foreign currency reserves. So we would have a huge amount of foreign currency reserves underpinning that Scottish currency. Assuming the oil uh, price held up. Oh, Mr. Even, 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 <laughs> George, even if you keep talking about a, a surplus, Jim, but that's based on your supposition that the oil price will remain high. I'm saying to you, you have to budget on the perfect possibility that the oil price will fall, in which case your reserves will fall. It's all a bit, all sounding a bit of a pig in a poke to me. Well, it, Mr. Galloway, if I can stick on the currency union, all right. if we can just stick there on the currency union for just as a long second, as you Mr. Galloway, it could fall. Sorry. <laughs> if we can stick on the currency union for just a second, yeah. uh, you as a an MP, English or not, if there is a yes vote, um, would you help campaign for a currency union? No. Uh, it would not be in the interests of my constituents in Bradford to have a currency union with a separate foreign country, as it would then become. So no, I wouldn't. And it's nonsense on stilts. Sorry to stress the point. As described by a certain Jim Sillers, to imagine that this currency union could possibly be achieved. Nobody in a divorce allows the wife or husband that walked out on them to continue to use their joint credit card. Just nonsense on stilts. We don't need a currency union. That's the point I'm making. It is perfectly possible to run a Scottish currency on the basis of our huge trade surplus on a one-to-one -one basis with sterling south of the border. No problem. We already do it How on a day-to-day -day basis. How did that Royal Bank of Scotland do, by the way? I, I, I've been out of Scotland nearly 10 years. How did it do that Royal Bank of Scotland? Is it doing fine? I don't know, George, you're the, you're the, the person yeah. in charge of these yeah, matters. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know as well as I do that the Royal Bank... And what if there's the another, Royal, what if there's George another banking crisis? Ah, okay. There you are now, George. What if there's another banking crisis? Well, of course, if you do read my book, you'll discover that uh, the regulation will be better. We'll divide between the investment banks and the retail banks. And you know... The, well, the banks will move out, no, Jim. Why, why would the bank stay in Scotland Tell me something, to John. be regulated by your sensible socialist policies when they could relocate to London no, and be regulated by nobody? Well, well, tell me something. Nobody ever asks RBS and company, where are you going to go? Has anybody ever moved house? You know the trauma, and that's a very small thing for individuals to do, moving house. Think of moving a major financial institution. Where are they going to go in London? one of the most expensive real estate places in the world. How much is it going to cost them to change the IT system from Edinburgh down to London? These are the questions that should be asked. Where are you going to relocate? Let me but, ask you, just because time, I'm afraid, is as always against us, uh, let's just ask about Europe, if you wouldn't mind. George Galloway, you want to stay in the EU. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't Scotland be in a pos better position on that front if it was independent? Well, because independent after the next Scotland, election, if there's a Conservative government at Westminster, there may well be a, a referendum yeah, on this. And I, I'm, confident the about the outcome. I'm confident about the outcome of that referendum. And I'll be campaigning to remain in the European Union, as anyone with any brain cells uh, will also be doing. But Scot an independent Scotland might not even be in the European Union. I don't know if you missed it last week. But the region of Venice just had a referendum to withdraw from Italy. The Northern League already wants to break up Italy. The <laughs> Flemish nationalists want to break up Belgium. The Basques and the, uh, and the Catalans want to break up Spain. And I could, believe me, go on. Why would the European Union states vote to allow a carte blanche to any part of any country that breaks away from the existing states to automatically accede to membership of the European Union. But isn't Scotland already a member? Are you suggesting that the EU would throw Scotland out? Well, it's not a question of what I'm suggesting. It's what the President of the European Union told you. And I think the shock value of that is still re to reverberate properly. Because if people vote for independence and this nonsense on stilts and end up not being allowed to enter the European Union, we'll really be up a gum tree. Um, 
I think it's one point, uh, Mr Galloway, you said that Scotland would risk become small-minded and insular if we were outside Europe. Mr Sillas, do you think that would be the case? I don't see why I should change inside or outside Europe. I, my mind is exactly the same as it was previously and will be the same tomorrow morning as well, and that applies to everybody in the country. I have a preference, which is for the European Free Trade Association, with Norway, Switzerland, Liechtenstein and Iceland. But look at it from the point of view of what the European Union preaches, bearing in mind that according to the legality, we are citizens of the European Union. It goes round this world preaching democracy, change peacefully by the ballot box. And nobody could question democratic, peaceful ballot box change if Scotland becomes independent. And but do we really will, Jim. No, do we really believe that on the international stage people would look at the EU and say they're a bunch of hypocrites? Well, they do that anyway no, no, because they are well, a bunch listen, of John, hypocrites. Listen, listen. Uh, right now, they are offering Ukraine, which isn't a member of the European Union, access to their markets. Are we really to believe that if we vote in a way that Brussels doesn't approve, they will expel us? And do we really believe that the Spanish will be happy about that, even taking Barcelona into account or the Catalans into account, because it destroys the common fisheries policy, one of the pillars of the European Union? Now, I say I prefer to be in EFTA mm. because you get access to the European Union's market automatically as a member of EFTA. But at the same time, I cannot conceive of the European Union expelling citizens for doing what they have preached to others, vote peacefully for change. There's no question of expulsion. You have to apply to join. The president Correct. of the European Union has already told you that. And there's no automaticity. How could there be? How could the Spanish or the Belgian or many other governments accept the automaticity of breakaway states automatically being a member of the European Union? Now, Jim doesn't want to be in the currency union, doesn't want to be in the European Union, he has a wholly different approach and perspective on these matters to what we're actually voting on. I say campaigning for a yes vote for nonsense on stilts is not likely to reverberate in many streets. Well, let's look at what might happen if there is a no vote. Would you like to see more powers for the Scottish Parliament? That's a matter for you. If you can come up with a scheme for more devolution. I was a Home Rule supporter from the 1970s, shoulder to shoulder with Jim Sillars, consistent with remaining within a state, the British state. I'm for as much devolution as we can muster. Well, that campaign was about a democratic deficit, as you saw it in the early 90s, Scotland United, etc. Has that deficit been dealt with? I think so, largely. Scotland has a parliament. It can protect itself uh, against the vicissitudes of Tory governments to an extent, but the only absolute protection is not to have the Tory governments at all, either next door to you as a different state or within your own state. And the most telling thing from tonight's debate for me is Jim's belief, which I share, that the Labour Party can be won back to real Labour. He thinks it can happen, will happen in Scotland, sufficient that they'll win in 2016. I say that's what we need to fight for across the country okay, Jim, as a whole. Sir, we are almost out of time, but just, if there is a no vote, which new powers will come to Scotland? Very little. The mistake George made when he replied was that that's for you to decide. It isn't. Devolution, as Enoch Powell said, is power retained at Westminster. And it's Westminster which will decide whether we get any more powers or not. And the maximum they're talking about at the moment is 40% control of the budget which also means somebody else down there controls 60% of the budget. Compared with the full control that independence oh. gives us, it's a pig in the pole. In a currency union, the other country will control far more than 60%. They'll control 100% of your monetary fiscal policy. They'll control your budget far more if you break Scotland up from the rest of the United Kingdom than you will with a devolved settlement. We are running out of time here, but uh, Jim Sillers, George Galloway has said that you would like to be Prime Minister of an independent Scotland. Would you vote for him? 
No, I'd vote for him. No, I wouldn't have vote for George. Because when you're be saying you'd vote for him, if Jim, if there was a yes vote and Jim Sillers was the one who shaped the socialist programme, yeah. you'd change if, your if, mind if, and vote for independence. If, if there was an independent Scotland, then uh, I'd be supporting Scotland. He was just about to insult me, so before he gets the insult in, let me make that clear. I have the highest admiration for him and have done for more than 40 years. But we both know that Alex Salmond will be the first Prime Minister. Keep no, that in your mind. No, why, I, why wouldn't you George vote for Mr Gallagher and Jim Sillers? George, George is an extremely able, very capable and very often brilliant politician. But he's a one-man band and I would not vote for a one-man band for Prime Minister. Who else is in your band? I'm not a band at all. I'm just an old-age pensioner <laughs> wandering around the country. <laughs> Making well, speeches, George. We're glad that you both wandered in here tonight. Let me thank you both very much indeed for joining us this evening. Thanks to our guests, Jim Sillers and George Galloway. And thanks to you for tuning in. Gordon is back tomorrow, but from us, good night. <laughs>